Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the opening program of the sixth annual Public Policy Conference, or APPC. The APPC is the highlight of the Development Policy Research Month, which we are celebrating this September. I'm Sheila Sierra, and I will be your MC morning, for the everyone. first part of our event this morning. To formally open our program and to tell us more about the DPRM and APPC, may I call on the president of PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Amsel? Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Socioeconomic Planning Secretary Carl Kendrick Chua, Senior Advisor for Governance and Equitable Growth, Finance and Institutions, Vice President of the World Bank Group in Singapore, James Bromby, Reboot Chief Executive Officer Pantheal Lee, DICT Director Maria Teresa Magno Garcia, UP School of Economics Professor Emeritus and Founding Father of PIDS, Gerardo Sicat, Makati Business Club Executive Director, Coco Alcuaz. Um, good morning. And let me also acknowledge some of the officials who are joining us this morning. Um, PIDS Trustee Gilbert Yanto and former PIDS Trustee and, and um, CIRCA Senior Fellow William Padolina. Uh, from the government, we have BBM Undersecretary Laura Pasqua, BILG Assistant Secretary Francisco Cruz, and from NEDA, we have Assistant Secretary Roderick Planta and um, Assistant Secretary Greg Pineda. Uh, we also have OIC Regional Director Susan Sumbiling and Regional Director Roan Bacal, um, ACPC Executive Director Jocelyn Alma Badiola, NCBA Executive Director Emerito Rojas, DOSC Regional Director Alexander Madrigal. Philippine Genome Center Senior Vice President Ian Briones, GSIS Senior Vice President Raquel de Guzman Buensalida, other officials from um, Department of Foreign Affairs, Department of Labor and Employment, Department of Social Welfare and Development, GSIS, SEC, Tariff Commission, CEPO, and CPBRD. And from the academe, we have Cagayan State University um, President um, Urduha Tejada, Southern Luzon State University President um, Dorazi Zoleta Nantes, UP Executive Vice President Teodora Herbosa, UPLB Graduate School um, Dean Jose Camacho Jr., and colleagues from University of Southeastern Philippines, Mamantasan and Lusud, Manila, Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology. We also have CSOs and international organization representatives. Let me welcome Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia Minister Councilor Kusuma Pradopo. European Union Attaché Stephanie Caret, UNIDO Country Representative Tony Lin Lim, International Poverty Action Country Director Nasrima Sampoko Badiri, Water and Life Philippines Country Director Alexia Michaels. To the other representatives um, of the government, academe, um, national lo and local governments, uh, business sector, civil society, and media, and to our viewers on Facebook, good morning to everyone. September is an important month for the Philippine Institute for Development Studies because it is Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM, as mandated by Presidential Decree 247. Through the DPRM, we hope to promote the importance of policy research in crafting evidence-based policies, plans, and programs, as well as foster a strong culture of research among decision makers. We also intend to increase the public's knowledge of development issues and elicit their participation in informed policy debates. Every year, we select a theme for the DPRM celebration from an array of current or emerging issues that require the attention of policymakers, stakeholders, and the general public. For 2020, we chose the theme, Bouncing Back Together, Innovating Governance for the New Normal, or in Filipino, Makabagong Pamamahala para sa Samasamang Pagbangon sa New Normal to highlight the importance of innovating our governance system so we can better respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and other threats. We want to send a message that the Philippines needs to have an agile and innovative government to thrive under the new normal. Indeed, the outbreak has thrown a curveball that brought significant impacts on a global scale. In the domestic front, it bared serious governance issues that need immediate action and resolution such as coordination failures, lack of protocols or manual of operation for handling large scale crisis, outdated information systems, lack of a verified tool for targeting social protection beneficiaries and challenges in human resource capacity. 
the four-part webinar series of this year's annual public conference, or APPC, which is the main activity of the DPRM celebration, will tackle ways by which we can address governance issues by looking at local and international practices, which the Philippines can adopt to be able to move forward from this pandemic and be resilient in the face of future challenges. Today, we open the four-part APPC webinar series with the topic, Innovation in Public Sector Governance for Resilience under a New Normal, Theory and Practice. The second webinar on September 17 will focus on institutional innovations and reforms under the new normal. The third webinar, which will be on September 22, will feature presentations on strengthening the civil service under the new normal. The fourth and last webinar on September 24 will revolve around the topic, Smart Systems for Agile Governance under the new normal. Before I end, let me take this opportunity to thank everyone. Um, to our speakers, thank you for accepting our invitation and for the willingness to share your valuable views in today's virtual event. To our guests uh, and participants, thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. To the PIDS technical team assigned to uh, draft this year's DPRM concept paper, composed of PIDS research fellows, Dr. Aubrey Tabuga, Dr. Justine Sika, Dr. Sunny Domingo, and Dr. Valerie Gilbert Ulep. With the guidance of Vice President Marife Balesteros, thank you very much for your efforts and comprehensive inputs. To our team from the Research Information Department, led by Dr. Sheila Siar, thank you for the various activities that you have organized to promote the DPRM and the APPC and for putting together all our webinars. We also thank the Banco Central ng Pilipinas for always extending its support to PIDS in the yearly conduct of the APPC. Let me also take this opportunity to acknowledge the continued support and cooperation of the permanent members of the DPRM Steering Committee composed of the National Economic and Development Authority, Civil Service Commission, Philippine Information Agency, DSP, Department of the Interior and Local Government, Presidential Management Staff, Department of Budget and Management, Senate Economic Planning Office, and the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department. We also thank the Department of Health, Department of Information and Communications Technology, and the Department of Social Welfare and Development for accepting our invitation to be part of this year's DPRM Steering Committee. Before I end, let me emphasize that dealing with this pandemic and other crises is the responsibility of everyone. This challenging time calls for a whole of society approach. Big or small, our efforts can help the country get back on track. May this conference inspire us to work together so that we can bounce back stronger from this pandemic and be able to rise above other crises in the future. Thank you and good day. And before I give back the floor to our MC, I'd like to invite all of you to view, um, to watch this video, which sums up the message of this year's DPRM theme. Thank you. Can we play the video? The earthquakes in 2020 are supposed to usher in new beginnings and signify renewed hopes and recharged potentials. But as the Philippines navigated the first quarter, a series of unfortunate events began to unravel. Said the eye volcanic eruption, the earthquakes in Mindanao, and a deadly fire spreading worldwide affecting mostly older people and those with compromised immune systems, hospitalizing the infected, paralyzing jobs, and placing the economy at a standstill. It happened gradually, then suddenly, it became out of hand. The COVID-19 has plunged the Philippines and the world into a crisis like no other. Now we find ourselves home quarantined and socially distanced. And as the pandemic continues to push the world from behind, people plottingly enter the new normal, lost and terrified. With the Philippines' future still uncertain, 
It is essential to know the serious impediments that slow the country from beating the novel coronavirus and from moving forward from the adverse effects of the socio-economic crisis so we can come up with solutions to help the country get back on its feet. The pandemic has exposed the weaknesses of our governance system, such as the lack of effective coordination between and among government units, the absence of clear protocols for manual of operations on managing health emergencies, outdated and fragmented information systems, lack of shared standards and interoperability, lack of reliable tools for targeting beneficiaries of social assistance programs, and an ill-equipped workforce at various levels of local administration. Our government is presented with the challenge of reviving the economy under the new normal, and the perennial threat of pandemics, climate change, food insecurity, and fiscal crises. Meanwhile, the business sector needs to reshape itself to thrive in a more uncertain and competitive environment. The academia is left to look for more innovative approaches to sustain education delivery in the new normal and to keep up with the fourth industrial revolution. And there's a troubling rise of public discontent due to limited resources and mobility and increasing joblessness and poverty. The coronavirus pandemic and other risk factors threaten our sustained economic progress and attainment of sustainable development. forward and recover from this crisis and face other challenges, we need to innovate governance across all sectors of society to steer the country toward the new growth and dynamism. We must, more than ever, work together as one nation to defeat this pandemic. This fight can be won with a concerted effort of all sectors of society. We can treat this pandemic as an opportunity to establish an innovative and agile governing system capable of managing risks and crises. The government should take the lead in creating an environment conducive to learning and innovation by addressing institutional coordination and infrastructural issues. It should strengthen the capacities of the civil service through continuous professional development and by establishing a reward and incentive system that emphasizes productivity and innovation. Government offices should develop smart systems to hasten the delivery of public services. To boost the country's resilience to risks and disasters, continuous human capital formation is a must. There should be more efficient access to healthcare services, broad-based access to quality education, and more effective social protection systems. Public and private sector agencies should update and foster interconnection and integration of information systems, promote data sharing and digitalization, and work together toward the advancement of the IT infrastructure. In aiming for organizational agility, the business sector must revisit and redefine their strategies and strive for survivability and resilience. The academy should be ready to provide flexible learning options for students to continue their education. To prepare young people for jobs of the future, the curriculum should include both cognitive and socio-emotional development and should be responsive to the needs of industry. Civil society organizations should also innovate their strategies and processes to better reach sectors that have limited access to government channels. The general public also plays a key role in helping the country bounce back in the new world. Citizens must be open to new ways of doing things. They should be adaptive and innovative in the face of adversity and change. They should retool and retrain by taking advantage of free learning opportunities. They must have an entrepreneurial mindset to thrive amid loss of income and rising unemployment. Despite the devastation that we are facing, we need to have faith that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and this shall soon pass. We should continue to focus our energies on mitigating the spread of the virus, on saving the economy from the damage caused by the pandemic, and on assisting affected sectors in coping with this crisis. Everything.
September, the Philippine Institute of Development Studies leads the entire nation in celebrating Development Policy Research Month for EPR to emphasize the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policy interventions to current and emerging development concerns. This year, we choose innovating governance for the new normal as the theme of the 2020 PPRM to rouse our collective consciousness as a nation toward one goal, to bounce back from this crisis by improving the way we govern ourselves and our country. The DPRM's main and culminating activity is the Annual Public Policy Conference, or APPC, which convenes and engages policymakers and analysts, social scientists, and representatives from the government, private sector, and civil society in a rational and evidence-based discussion of issues, opportunities, and policy options. With this year's DPRM celebration, we hope to encourage our fellow civil servants and other development actors and stakeholders to be innovative and agile to help our country move forward from this pandemic. Together, we can bounce back stronger in the new normal. Our keynote speaker was appointed Acting Socioeconomic Planning Secretary and Director General of the National Economic and Development Authority on April 17, 2020. His top three priorities upon being appointed amid the COVID-19 crisis include fast-tracking the national ID system, the Economic Recovery Plan, and the Build, Build, Build program. Prior to his appointment, he was Undersecretary for the Strategy, Economics and Results Group in the Department of Finance. In this capacity, he helped the government implement its 10-point socioeconomic agenda by ensuring equitable and sustainable financing through the Comprehensive Tax Reform Program. Prior to joining the government, he was the World Bank's Senior Country Economist for the Philippines. In this capacity, he advised the government on strategies and policies to attain more inclusive growth, the type that creates more and better jobs and reduces poverty. Acting Secretary Shua completed his MA in Economics in 2003 and PhD in Economics in 2011 at the University of the Philippines School of Economics. Here now is Secretary Shua for his message. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Dr. Uh, Jerry Sikat, the first NEDA secretary, Mr. Jim Bromby, who was one of my bosses in the World Bank many years ago, and Dr. Celia Reyes, and our partners from the Institute for Devel Philippine Institute for Development Studies, colleagues in government, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. Thank you for inviting me to the sixth annual public policy conference. I would like to give special thanks to PIDS, led by President Celia Reyes, for organizing this conference and helping equip the government address this crisis. Throughout the years, PIDS has contributed to the pursuit for evidence-based policymaking in the country. Today, better and timely policy research in crafting our development plans, programs, and policies are even more necessary as we face an unprecedented crisis that requires critical collaboration among stakeholders, policymakers, and other decision makers across various fields and disciplines. This year has brought enormous challenges, not just to the Philippines, but also to all economies around the world. Our country faced significant economic shocks from the eruption of the Al Volcano in January to the need to implement various forms of quarantines around the country to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. Before the pandemic, we had a very strong economy and we were on track to becoming an upper middle income country by 2022, 
we had low and stable inflation, which averaged 3% from 2016 to 2019, largely supported by the passage of the rice tarification law. And we had the highest uh, revenue to GDP ratio in decades at 16.1%, and the lowest debt to GDP ratio in 2019 at 39.6%, enabled largely by the comprehensive tax reform program. Our Build, Build, Build infrastructure program doubled as a share of GDP compared to the past five decades at over 5% of GDP in 2019. We also achieved the highest credit ratings in history from various agencies in the range of BBB plus to A minus. We had one of the lowest unemployment rates at around 5% and underemployment rate at around 14.8% in January 2020. And also we achieved the lowest poverty incidence of 16.7% as of 2018. All these have led to significant results. The 2022 promise of lifting 6 million Filipinos out of poverty was achieved in 2018 or four years ahead of the target. This was made possible by a significant drop of the overall poverty rate from 23.5% to 16.7% between 2015 and 2018. Unfortunately, no one anticipated that the COVID pandemic will strike the global economy. In the first three months of the quarantine, we prioritized saving of lives from COVID and use this time to improve our health system capacity. With around 75% of the economy effectively shut down due to the implementation of the strict community quarantines, our GDP contracted by as much as 16.5% in the second quarter. The good news is that as quarantine restrictions ease starting June, we saw a gradual recovery. Some monthly indicators, such as the growth of the power transmission energy delivery, volume of manufacturing production, and merchandise trade have generally begun to U-turn since May and June and continue to show improvement in the more recent data releases. Meanwhile, our inflation remains low and stable due to the recent reforms such as the rice tarification law and adequate supply of basic commodities. More importantly, what we find in the past three months is that the lower quarantine restrictions actually opened more sectors of the economy and helped bring back jobs quickly. We are seeing a significant decline in the unemployment rate from 17.7% in April at the height of the quarantine to 10% in July when we relaxed the quarantine and also a decline in the underemployment rate. All in all, 7.5 million jobs were restored to the economy in just one quarter as the quarantine restriction is. This is a testament to this very strong economic foundation that we have today. The contraction of the economy this year, however, may result in the temporary yet slight reversal of the significant gains we have made with respect to poverty reduction. Given the disruption in economic activities, poverty incidents may temporarily increase by up to 17.5%. However, we believe that even with this setback, the goal of bringing down poverty to 14% by 2022 is still certainly doable. As new data comes in, what we currently see suggests that economic recovery will rely on how much we are able to help our economy open while practicing appropriate social distancing and appropriate or proper health protocols. GDP is projected to contract by around 5.5% in 2020, with a band of 4.5 to 6.6% contraction before recovering to around 6.5 to 7.5% positive growth in 2021 and 2022. Even as we see some light at the end of the tunnel, we must remain vigilant against possible risks to our growth outlook and ensure that our policy strategies are responsive to the evolving circumstances that we are in. The task ahead requires innovative and creative solutions that can effectively balance our COVID and other objectives. That is why the government's response is a phase and adaptive recovery approach that prioritizes health as well as the recovery of consumer confidence towards opening up more of the economy. Between March to May of this year, Congress passed by Nihan 1. And that is what we have been using to address the emergency stage of the crisis. From around June to December 2020, we are in the recovery stage, 
and that calls for a combination of key legislation, such as the recently uh, uh, enacted by Anihan II, which the President signed last September 11, and the passage of the Guide, Fist, and Create Bills to aid the recovery of the country. The Guide Bill is basically our support to strategically important but insolvent firms. Our FIS bill is our support to the banking sector to sell or offload non-performing assets so they can free up more capital to lend to micro, small, and medium enterprises. And the CREATE bill is basically our tax incentives program that will lower the income tax for all businesses while ensuring that we give tax incentives in a performance-based, targeted, time-bound, and transparent manner. For 2021, we are currently working with both houses of Congress to pass a budget that will be more responsive to the need of the country, including the creation of around 1.6 million jobs as the infrastructure budget is increased to 1.12 trillion, which will ensure continuous job creation amid our recovery. With uh, what this crisis has made apparent is a need for us to innovate governance and the importance of effective coordination if we hope not just to outlast but also build resilience against adversities such as this. Government must be the one to provide the direction and impetus for innovation to prosper. We must set the example by recalibrating our systems and processes to suit the needs and demands of the new normal. This entails using new technologies in developing tools that can make the delivery of public services more effective and efficient. Innovation, whether under ordinary or extraordinary times, thrives best when ideas are shared freely, debated, and refined. The development and diffusion of innovation across the bureaucracy and the country cannot take place if people are working in silos. Lastly, I wish to emphasize the value of forging dynamic multi-stakeholder partnerships. The reality is that the government does not have all the resources to respond to this pandemic, nor all the capabilities to develop the digital tools and other tools that can support people in this crisis. Building strategic partnerships with the business sector, the academe, and the scientific community is an effective way to address resource constraints and tap the wealth of ideas, technologies, expertise, and networks that reside outside of government. Effective public-private cooperation in technology generation, testing, polishing, and transfer are crucial to make governance innovation happen, especially in this new normal. We each have had to make immense sacrifices throughout this pandemic, whether in our personal capacity or in the work that we do, and the road ahead of us still remains uncertain. Now is the time for us to come together to find solutions, not just on what to do, but also on how to do them. These are extraordinary trying times, and the road ahead of us continues to be challenging and uncertain. I call on all of us public servants and researchers and the rest of the country to work together on further building the economy towards a healthy and more resilient Philippines. Thank you and take care always. Thank you very much, Secretary Chua. We now proceed to webinar one on innovation in public sector governance for resilience under a new normal theory and practice. This webinar session will be moderated by Mr. Coco Alcuas. Mr. Alcuas is the executive director of the Bicatica Business Club. And prior to joining uh, the MBC, he was bureau chief at Bloomberg News, business news head at um, an anchor at ABS CBN News Channel and contributor at, at Rappler. I'll now turn this event over to Mr. Alcuas. Coco? Thank you very much, Sheila. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you very much, Sheila, for that introduction. And of course, for inviting me and MBC to participate again in your APPC. I always enjoy these APPC conferences or these uh, public policy conferences. And it's not just because of your great notebook, which I take home every year. In fact, I'm using last year's notebook uh, currently. Uh, I gather, however, that because we're virtual this year, the notebook is also virtual. In other words, there's no notebook. So I'm really looking okay. forward I'm really looking forward to a non-virtual event next year. Um, I want to welcome- Please uh, enable your video, please. Enable your video. Sorry, uh, as I was saying, I really enjoy these uh, conferences because of, these, of this great notebook that, uh, that you always give out. 
In fact, I'm using last year's notebook currently. And uh, I'd rather, however, that this year, because we're virtual, the notebook is also virtual. And so uh, there is no notebook. And so that, that means I'm really looking forward to a non-virtual event next year. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to this first webinar, first of four webinars in this year's APPC. Our topic today is Innovation in Public Sector Governance for Resilience under a New Normal. This is a great topic because while we're all coping and adjusting, hopefully with data, but inevitably most of these are ad hoc, hopefully with as much data as we can get, muster, muster. It is important to think about the governance part of how we, government and the private sector, and sometimes government and the private sector together, are arriving at these interventions. Because COVID-19 has changed not just the problems, but also how we are producing and implementing solutions. Moreover, we're going to be doing this in this manner for a while. Before I introduce the speakers, some house rules. The participants' microphones have been muted upon entry to prevent background noise. To ask a question, participants should please use the chat box. They should type their name, affiliation, and their question and send their message to all panelists. There's an option for all panelists in your chat box. Those who are watching the webinar's live stream on the PIDS Facebook page may send their questions during uh, using the comment section. The moderator, that's me, will read one or two of the questions from Facebook. Before I introduce the speakers, allow me to remind the speakers that they have 25 minutes each and that the reactors and panelists have 15 minutes each. There will be buzzers to remind them of, uh, of these time limits. As Dr. Reyes said, we have with us today Jim Bumby from the World Bank, Panthea Lee from Reboot, Tess Garcia from DICT, and Dr. Gerardo Sicat, who needs no introduction. Allow me to introduce them in turn. Our first speaker, and uh, our first speaker will be Jim Bumby from the World Bank. He is now a senior advisor at the World Bank in Singapore, but he still leads the COVID-19 response of the World Bank's global governance practice. He previously worked at OECD, IMF, and the Treasury Departments at New Zealand and Victoria Province in Australia. Allow me to introduce Jim Bumby of the World Bank. Jim. Thank you very much, um, and um, sorry for the pause there. Uh, and uh, good morning to you all, a virtual good morning uh, to, to everybody. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to be on this panel, uh, Dr. Reyes and uh, Carl Chua, thank you very much uh, for welcoming me. And also thank you very much for your excellent uh, introductions uh, this morning to this conference. Um, let me share my screen if I may. Okay. Uh, so let me get, uh, I'll just put it on to the presentation mode. Okay. Um, so there have been really three prongs to the response to COVID as captured in my title slide. It's been about addressing the health emergency, protecting the poor and the most vulnerable, and providing support to the economy. I think we heard quite a lot about that, both uh, in the video and also from Carl. For our part at the World Bank, we've announced that we'll lend 160 billion over the 15 month period to June next year in support of the responses to COVID. These operations are overwhelmingly uh, focused in these three areas. But today, I think we're here to discuss what could be called uh, the missing middle, uh, the glue that may well decide how the world comes through this testing time. That is how the state should adapt to a post COVID world. I think the first lesson of COVID is a very difficult one for us all. And that is that the past may not be a good guide to the future. We have a temptation, I think, to say, this is the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu, the worst global downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s. But none of us have 
lived experience of these on the one hand, and the world is a completely different place on the other, suggest these comparators of specifics are at best a distraction and quite probably uh, not very helpful. So let's suspend that orientation and look to our imaginations uh, to rethink a future while drawing on a more generalized lessons um, from the past. We may revert to the mean in some areas, but we're unlikely to revert to the mean in every area of, of government. We do know that when crisis hits, unexpected crises in particular, it does make us rethink our approaches over time. The crisis creates attitudinal shifts which lead to behavioural change. September 11th, for instance, did create change, but in many ways, in a sense, it was more of a correction than a new normal. Many of the systems were already in place, they were just not being uh, enforced properly. If we were to think of a model of adaptation, it's broadly as follows, which is the shock hits, it reshapes our thinking, and then we shift uh, our behaviour. But the shock, of course, does not happen in a vacuum. It occurs in the context of many other things. Consequences can be non-linear and very difficult uh, to foresee. Governments are wrestling with this change and doing variably well at different times. We do know that calls of victory have proven premature. COVID just keeps coming. Early attempts to characterise the response to COVID drew on examples from disaster risk management with three discrete stages of broadly response, recovery and reconstruction. This is a sort of a ready aim fire approach to disaster risk management. In fact, what we have seen something in many countries that could really be described as fire aim ready. Governments have generally announced a determination to take action before they'd worked out what to do. Those with fiscal capacity, and I'll return to that, announced far reaching fiscal support packages, sometimes called stimulus. They were in fact packages of support in a lot of cases, not really a stimulus. Then the governments would adjust the parameters of the policy announcements, that is the aiming, prior to actually getting ready uh, to launch them. In some cases, in fact, in most cases, countries have continued to recalibrate their approaches with subsequent announcements. Although there's a yearning to focus on the recovery from COVID, we're still not truly there as yet, but it is a good time to think of the construction of the post-COVID reality, what expectations may come from citizens and how governments may be placed in this world. So today I would like to focus on the following, the evolving role for the centre of government, the reforms to service delivery, the reorientation in financial management to focus more on stocks as well as on flows, an acknowledgement of the changing world order, and finally, a consolidation of the implications for non-traditional sources of information and what it means for the way that government conducts its business. The effect on government, on government, its structure, its organisation and what it does are in fact still emerging. It's, this still has a, uh, has a long way to run. The only thing helping some governments look good uh, in the management of COVID is that some other countries may look worse. As one newspaper reported, uh, no previous governments have been mugged by reality quite like this. Building back better and uh, resilience, two expressions I heard in the first few minutes, have become really the catch phrases of this pandemic. The meaningful protracted execution of both, especially for developing countries and for at-risk populations, is not truly clear, but that's what we're working towards. While some reversion to the mean may occur, we expect more non-linear events, unforeseen events to occur. So let's move to coordination and control at government uh, centre of government. The ability to deal with COVID has shed light really on what happens at the centre of government. Countries have used their centre of government functions differently depending on the systems and processes in place and the complexity or size of their country and prevailing institutions. For instance, big countries in size and population are typically federations or have many of the, character, many of the characteristics 
of uh, federations, um, uh, cases like China and Indonesia. So managing across the levels of government becomes fundamental. In many countries, the systems at the centre of government have been, been found very lacking, hence the reliance on this approach of fire, aim, ready. But coming out of COVID, countries will consider how they operate at the centre of government and the way in which it can or cannot function as a command centre. Work we did several years ago traced the concentration of financial authority at the centre of government. For many countries, the development process was often associated with the consolidation of financial functions to exercise greater control in the earlier stages of development. But as countries developed with more sophisticated and disciplined processes at the centre of government, the need to co-locate functions in single agencies reduced. In times as the state uh, centre of government became stronger, the state can empower specialist agencies. Some countries have not really gone through this process as fully as others. And I'd say that those countries are often associated with a slower process of reform with more contestation uh, at the centre of government. The desirability of this process or this transition has been learned the hard way. Two very prominent British economists, Paul Collier and John Kay, recently produced a study called Greed is Dead. Uh, they showed much of the British post-war economic malaise and in fact Soviet collapse was driven by an excessive use of centralisation with assumed benefits and scale. Whereas in fact, many presumed economies of scale create diseconomies of management and execution. It's about evidence, it's evidence that supports the thrust now for, for agility. COVID responses have leveraged four identified areas of concentration at the centre of government being policy setting and decision making, operational coordination, information gathering with monitoring and evaluation, and importantly, uh, communication. So there's some examples on the slide. Many more than 30 developing countries and a host of developing countries, uh, developed countries have enleased uh, COG reforms. Uh, drivers of the actions uh, being taken reflect the size and the complexity of the um, of the country context and the capabilities uh, at the start of the government administration and its mechanism. A colleague has uh, different countries placed in each of the cells and the two by two at the bottom of the slide. These trends for a calibrated centre of government with specialist agencies may be reflected also in uh, changed modes of delivery. The shape of future government service delivery is being influenced by at least three factors. Uh, first of all, contagion risk, which is determined by the prevalence of the physical proximity within the public service workforce for a given function, proximity between workers and customers or clients, the degree to which physical objects need to be passed from one to another, and the shared air for client groups or employee groups or across the two groups. Uh, taken overpopulated immigration arrival hall, which we've uh, all experienced in uh, airports around the world, including Manila, where passengers bring their pathogens there and then congregate sometimes for some hours, sharing the space, materials and air with other passengers who bring other pass uh, pathogens and immigration officials. This will change. Um, the second factor, so the first is contagion risk, the second is technological process substitution, in particular digitalization, being the ability to replace uh, physical and uh, human processes that historically been required, with, uh, especially associated with physical presence, with ones that do not require presence. The point is that digital substitution for events and delivery need not lower the satisfaction from the experience. Uh, in fact, I got married uh, in June and it was a Zoom wedding and uh, the responses from my um, guests was extremely positive about that. The third factor, uh, which is dealing with fiscal and wider public sector financial stress. The large economic support programs in 2020 will crowd out public spending in future years. High cost delivery will likely be replaced by lower cost delivery and market-based and uh, private sector solutions are likely to dominate. Um, at the bank, we've looked at these two factors in the context of the third factor, 
and that is where contagion risk can be lowered and digitised delivery used while saving money. Research, research shows generally public service work when work type as performed by occupations that generally involve a higher degree of person-to-person -person contact than private sector. Uh, when we look across the public sector at services, there are many that may benefit uh, from rapid adoption of new technologies. Uh, those identified include tax administration in some countries, which are still using manual processes, one-stop shops, uh, uh, low-risk prisoners, immigration at airports, which I mentioned, police desk work, uh, motor registration and similar registration services, customs employment services, airports more generally, train stations, secondary schooling, immigration, foreign offices, public transportation, voting uh, and the centre of government policy functions. So in some cases reduction of viral contagion risk may involve capital works and redesign in addition to or rather than the use of digital or other GovTech devices. Other changes in work practices or actions will be required to manipulate or guide demand. These forces were already at hand, but COVID has accelerated them. Threats of new pathogens will continue to stimulate this. Vietnam, for instance, has set itself the objective of being totally digital by 2025 and to be among the top handful of countries in the region. Singapore uh, knows its role as a regional travel hub depends on creating a safe space for passengers at Changi. A contactless Changi experience is the objective and reforms are well on the way to that end with proximity sensors rather than touch sensors, iris and facial recognition immigration lanes to complement the robots that spurt out disinfecting mist to keep the airport clean. There is a link on this slide and I encourage you to look at it when it's distributed. In recent years, there's also been a push to question the ongoing use of cash money, especially large denomination uh, bills. In large uh, post-COVID world of heightened concern for, for viral transmissions where investment in digital technologies have been pushed forward rapidly, where governments can less afford the leakages associated with illicit transfers, it is re reasonable to question the outlook for cash money. In India, for example, the United Payments Corporation required, has recorded the highest level ever monthly digital payments uh, during the pandemic. In our own work at the bank under the heading of GovTech, we've identified actions likely to assist government's successful adoption of these strategies. And I know that they're actions that are very much at the fore in the Philippines, including the recognition of country level constraints, the need to address those constraints and, and the sometimes divide in levels of access to ensure uh, appropriate inclusivity. Uh, these sorts of changes will, of course, also affect the demand for workers and the type of workers in the public sector. Uh, the future for work was already under massive pressure to change. Now the pressure has intensified in public and private sectors. Post-COVID may look quite different across the sectors. For some countries, public transportation may be at a tipping point for ever having been thought of a socially de desirable aspect of living in cities that is being questioned. Suddenly the nature of the commute may be changing and the relative desirability of public transport from a health perspective uh, is being questioned. Uh, the managing director of Ile de France Mobility, for instance, is saying investment in public transport should stop now. Uh, British economist here, Chris Nash, uh, Van Dyer's at recently said, having spent his whole career with the senior objective of increasing ridership, he questions whether that uh, objective is still relevant. Um, he notes that for a hundred years or close enough to uh, public transport had been quite resilient to many changes in society. But he notes that the alternatives to travel seem so attractive and so little known before the pandemic that perhaps uh, this could be different. Now, the complexity of this shift for many cities and states can't be underestimated. Fixed costs are high, deterioration in ridership or even change time of day pricing may compromise much of the current model and expose government, parent governments to considerable fiscal risks. Sunk costs may be sunk, but operating cost decisions keep recurring. 
it's extraordinary to think that some public transport assets, some may become stranded. Agility may be one way through this, especially for those who have not invested so heavily in high capital cost systems. Governments have been prepared to make reforms, such as introduce bike lanes uh, or bus lanes on major thoroughfares uh, when they were not previously prepared to do that. And um, the 644 kilometres uh, announced in Singapore is, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, in Manila uh, is, a, is a case in point. Um, my colleagues at the, at the bank have reviewed, um, I'm moving on to the fiscal side, have reviewed the 2,500 or so fiscal measures that were initially introduced in response to COVID. With such an emphasis on speed, uh, health and those most in need, the spider diagram is no surprise. It was uh, common to select policies that did not conflict with social distancing uh, requirements brought relatively fast relief, were scalable in, times of, uh, uh, in terms of time and magnitude or targeted benefits, beneficiaries, and were possible to discontinue at, uh, at an intended time, i.e. they were reversible. On the other hand, most countries chose policies for which the benefit felt by beneficiaries was entirely paid for by government, which is uh, low affordability. Additionally, performance, on targetability, administrative complexity, abuse resistance, et cetera, and was quite unexceptional on average, although significantly different across countries. As the economy has been put to sleep in many countries, governments have had to borrow much more, but also take over a considerable number of assets, for instance, in aviation. The net result for many will be that while liabilities and contingent liabilities through guarantees will have increased substantially, so too will have assets. But coming out of the COVID period, there's likely uh, to be therefore a shift in fiscal management. Uh, there's good reason to think uh, that this may be concentrated in developing countries where spending multipliers are generally found to be lower than in developed countries. So that the recovery period may be longer. Uh, uh, using spending data in, in uh, from World Bank Lending finds that spending multipliers in developing countries typically around 0.4 or 0.5, which is much less than uh, one, which is usually considered uh, the minimum in developed countries. This may drag out the recovery process in some developing countries, encouraging a closer look at the value tied in their balance sheets to see if some of this cannot be released to assist the recovery effort. And my colleagues at the IMF in its balance sheet project has noted that once government understands the size and nature of public assets and start managing them more efficiently, the potential gains can be up to 3% of GDP a year. These are very substantial. Um, the other area to focus, which is, as Carl mentioned, is in the area of uh, tax, uh, because tax is in a sense a contingent uh, asset. Governments with strong balance sheets do come out of recessions faster. So it's not past possible to backfill the asset side of the balance sheet. Um, however, it is going forward, uh, very possible to consider more directly the management of the balance sheet uh, for, to assist this fiscal process. And while the, um, while the increase in debt levels, the graph at the bottom of the page is unprecedented, more than a hundred years as shown uh, there, uh, the graph on the right shows that in many countries, uh, the liabilities, which is the, uh, sorry, the assets, which is the blue side, uh, outweighs or is very, very significant relative to the liabilities. Uh, so that is a, a hidden strength uh, for governments to manage uh, through this process. Uh, the graph at the top of the page shows that um, by uh, 2025, 65% of all countries will be using accrual accounting which is important information uh, to feed into that. Philippines uh, already produces accrual information and that too is consistent with the very considerable assets uh, that are on hand uh, to the Philippines government, which can be made use of. Um, the global financial crisis uh, gave us the, um, uh, gave the world the G20 and increased concern for mutuality in addressing 
global imbalances. The trade wars were already underway uh, when COVID hit. Uh, we're not sure yet what the pandemic will give us, but some of the hallmark international drives over the past decade, such as the BRI, have become lightning rods uh, for some interest. Uh, the Economist, for instance, has also pondered the effects of the so-called uncoupling. Perhaps the response will be called economic prosperity networks or the Chinese plus supply chains, um, time will tell. Uh, one thing for sure is that there will be unintended consequences or spillovers uh, from reset geopolitics. Uh, for instance, uh, winemakers exporting product to uh, China have been uh, threatened with massive retaliatory tariffs uh, to, um, as a response really to these tensions. Now, I do want to, before I finish, just focus on what I think is very important is that government information uh, will be challenged. The events around the crisis have made clear that non-traditional information sources may be increasingly important and profoundly influential. Governments need to get used to the idea that big data can mean citizens not in the chain of command may know more about what's happening than those relying on official information. The sources of this non-traditional data are listed on the right hand side. Uh, a study from Harvard, uh, for instance, suggests that big data can place the origin of the virus earlier uh, and further south than the Chinese bureaucratic information system would suggest. And, you know, that included looking at indicators such as parking lot traffic in Chinese hospitals. Now, it may or may not be right, but it acts to contest the information monopoly usually associated with expert bureaucracies. Perhaps that's why the Chinese authorities were so damning in their response. These non-traditional sources of information can inform more direct action by citizens, empower the challenge to the state's policy action, and may change the reactions uh, from the state. As well as telling us, for instance, where relief transfers are being used uh, for purchasing staples, such as the work of Raj Chetty in the United States, and therefore how the economic stimulus is really working, these sources can inform public discourse and bring light uh, of, for instance, excessive use of uh, force by security. Technology access and voice are currently in something of a shifting game. It's not clear how it will end up but it's possible that more of government will need to be conducted on the assumption that everything is potentially in the public domain. Uh, the new platforms give citizens a credible threat of exposure. Singapore has found that 70% of citizens believe the government should consult with them in the design and delivery of public services. Micro actions have the potential to affect macro reactions. There are many public policies to work through including uh, the role of some very big players associated with that. So let me move to my conclusion. In many countries, leaders and their governments got a trust bump at the outset of COVID. Citizens looked to government first as a source of potential help uh, through COVID. Citizens had to trust government as government was the obvious single source of response to the crisis. But the pandemic is far from over, even countries that look to be winners have had shocks. Even yesterday, the UK and Israel announced step ups in their lockdown. Citizen trust in government has now been battered. To regain the trust and legitimacy, governments need to respond. Today, I've tried to lay out some of those areas around the centre of government, around changes in fiscal management, around adopting contactless forms of service delivery and working to make the new world order work for its citizens. Citizens will have an increasing ability to hold government to account. Government will need to respond in an agile way, making use like citizens of new form of information and data to inform policy. COVID has been desperately difficult for many people, but it's also not been that difficult for some. The unevenness requires government to be especially conscious in its longer term response of addressing the needs of those suffering and not providing a free ride to those who have not suffered much at all. Thank you, back to you, Coco. Thanks very much, Jim. Jim, did I hear you correctly? You got married in June? I did say that, yes. I, 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 I'm sorry, I forgot that I, I didn't get to mention that in your intro. 
<laughs> I don't think I put it in my bio. <laughs> that certainly sounds like a great approach to COVID. One approach <laughs> that you did not cover in your presentation. No, exactly, exactly. We hope to have you well, back next. We hope to have you back next year to tell you how that's going. That that intervention. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Our uh, next speaker is Panthea Lee. She's the executive director at Reboot. Reboot is just a 10-year organization that Panthea started or co-founded in 2010, but it's already in 40 countries designing, strategizing, and organizing projects to advance public discourse and action for social justice. Uh, previously, Panthea was a journalist, uh, has worked with UNICEF and OECD, both times uh, in the innovation space, and with the World Economic Forum or WEF. I think she's still connected with that in a project on partnering civil society under the fourth industrial revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, Panthea Lee. Panthea? Great, thanks so much. Uh, and thank you, uh, excellent presentation, James, and uh, really honored to be here with all of you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and let me know if this is working. Um, Can you all see, see my screen now? Not yet. Oh, apologies. Let's try. Coming up. There, we got okay. it. Yeah, okay. Great. Excellent. Well, again, um, good, good, good morning, though it is 4 a.m. where I am right now. So it is a uh, really good morning. Um, wonderful to, to uh, be here with all of you. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here. And so thank you um, to PIDS and the organizing committee for having me. So, uh, so I am Panthea and I am the co-founder and executive director of, of, of Reboot. And we work at the intersection of governments, international agencies, civil society, and uh, media to co-design and co-create uh, policies, partnerships, initiatives, whatnot. And I think I'm joining you this morning feeling a little bit sheepish and a bit chagrined um, because while I have uh, worked across Asia um, and worked extensively in Southeast Asia, I've actually never worked in the Philippines and um, I have never lived in the Philippines. Um, these, oops, let me move this. Um, these are some of our partners, but I've never worked in the country. and. I think that, you know, as I was preparing for this and uh, taking a look at some of the challenges that the country is facing and some of the questions that you'll have posed for us to explore together this morning, I, um, I, I, I really started challenging the notion of um, expertise and international expertise and where and how folks like myself can be valuable. Um, I recognize that, that I was invited here and very graciously through the recommendation of an American expert, um, a white man in America. And uh, while I'm grateful for the invitation, I, 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 I also hope that through this, through this conversation, we might explore and challenge and even um, rethink um, what expertise means um, in the context of uh, new forms of governance and, uh, new, and uh, new normals. So my background is as a journalist, as an ethnographer, as a community organizer, and I think it is from that perspective that I want to have this conversation here today. Um, I've spent a lot of my career and time speaking with communities and living amongst communities that most folks, I think, that I work with in government do not really spend their time talking with or listening to. And so these are some of the perspectives that I hope to bring here today. To kick off this conversation, I want to take us back to April. Um, many folks may be familiar with this piece that Arundhati Roy published in the Financial Times in early April where she talked about the, pan the pandemic as a portal. And she ended with this really brilliant quote. Um, she said, historically, pan pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and to reimagine our world anew. This one, coronavirus, is no different. She described it as a portal and as a gateway between one world and the next. And I think so much of this conversation today here is about how do we reimagine the future? How do we build that better, whatnot? And I think in early April, it was, while those days were difficult and scary, 
it was also easier, I think, to be hopeful and to think about what differences in uh, differences in how we govern, how we organize, how we collaborate might be different. I think there was a lot more hope. Um, and we saw a lot of international repositories being set up, a lot of international reporting and collaboration and reimagining around uh, the new possible. So this is a project called The New Possible, where we were documenting different responses of international governments and private sector and civil society, um, where we were suddenly housing the homeless and treating migrants as uh, as real people and ditching outdated economic growth models and thinking about how we prioritize citizen and resident safety over um, over uh, economic growth. And um, and so this was, a, this was a, I think, a really exciting time for people working in my space, working in think tank space, um, and working in civil society. And yet today, as we continue with the pandemic and think about uh, just how hard it is that we're all fighting, it can also be hard to consider reimagining when this is our daily reality. Uh, I think I pulled this just yesterday. And yet we must. We must rethink how our outdated forms of governance and of um, economic growth have not served us. And we also need to recognize that the institutions that have been responsible for the crisis, I don't believe in my humble opinion, are going to be the only ones that are going to be able to get out of this. And so we need new paradigms. We need new ways of thinking. And I believe that we need to reimagine the social contract. And I think in so much of my work now, as I've been talking with governments and international agencies and multi-stakeholder fora, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the social contract and what citizens must do and why aren't citizens listening to these regulations and why these citizens aren't following these um, these um, these uh, these regulations and norms and programs that have been passed down, and yet I think sometimes we forget to recognize that the social contract, as it, as it has been designed, hasn't been perceived to be legitimate by a lot of communities and by a lot of citizens. I am currently based in the U.S., so that's not where I am right now, and I think that the strength and the um, the momentum of the Black Lives Matter movement is only showing just how broken and how illegitimate the social contract was. And so we're now talking about how we need to redesign this and it will only be legitimate and upheld and sustainable if I believe we design it with people. And so what does that mean? And I think when I talk with governments, I think many of us say, well, you know, communities don't have the resources, they don't have the expertise, they don't have the degrees, they don't have the, you know, whatnot. But I hope to um, share an example from my home of the power of community response to, 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 to illustrate that I think there is a path forward where we can co collaborate hand in hand with civil society and with community groups. And so I just want to take you now to my, uh, my home of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, this, is a, this is a photo from a couple blocks near my house. Um, and so I live in Bedside, Brooklyn. And it is a community, uh, it's really vibrant, culturally rich, culturally diverse community. It is uh, predominantly African American and it is known in New York City, oops, um, known in New York City for its um, really amazing summer block parties. Um, it is also a community that is, um, you know, has a median income that is quite a bit lower than uh, that, that the, the average of New York City. And there is a lot of existing inequalities, uh, racial inequalities and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, socioeconomic inequalities within Bedstuy. So early on in the crisis, we were really badly hit, not, um, not amongst the worst in New York City, but uh, we were doing pretty poorly. <laughs> And um, there was uh, food insecurity, uh, mass unemployment, and uh, our community was devastated. What did we do? People banded together. Um, people banded together and we thought about how do we ensure that we have neighbors taking care of neighbors? And what we did was, um, and I do not take credit for any of this, I'm only a lowly, measly volunteer, but uh, there was a group of community organizers that started a community called Bedside Strong. 
where we were starting to uh, just take calls around how we could support neighbors through this crisis. And, um, and rapidly, within about two weeks, we built up this incredibly robust uh, rapid response system. Um, uh, Mr. Brumby talked about sort of agility um, and, and we need agility to respond to this crisis. And I think there is no, uh, I, I, I have literally never seen um, such, a, such a fast and robust system being set up overnight. And I've worked on many humanitarian response systems. Um, I've worked on a lot of sort of, you know, uh, social service and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, public service systems. Um, you'll see here that I blocked out some of this because of, of uh, privacy concerns. But essentially, um, over about two weeks, we had community members come together, all volunteers, and build this really, really rapidly. And what would happen is we would have neighbors calling up to a, a Google Voice hotline and talking about what they needed. We were using chatbots and AI and um, really robust uh, data analytics, um, all done in real time to be able to pull the system together. And honestly, it is one of the most um, robust and sophisticated uh, service delivery systems that I have seen um, surpassing anything that I've seen in the public sector. And that's working with some of the most um, advanced uh, government innovation groups within you know, presidential initiatives and whatnot. And, um, and you can see this is the back end you know, somewhat on how we cobbled it together in the early days. Within um, and in the last six months, this is what happened. And, you know, bed size strong doesn't really matter. Um, but what I wanted to illustrate is that in about six months, we have served about 7% of the population in bed -Stuy, um, delivering about uh, groceries worth about a quarter of a million meals through 4,000 members and really serving the most vulnerable, the elderly, the low income, the immunocompromised. And we have raised about um, half a million dollars or uh, 24 million pesos for our community fund from over a thousand individuals. And when I talk to governments about this, because I'm, uh, this is all nights and weekends work because my day job is working with governments. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm often told, well, we'd love to partner with them, but we don't have the partnership frameworks. We don't have the legal frameworks. It's complicated. Activists are going to yell at us. We don't really know what it's, it, it, it's going to accomplish. And this is what it accomplishes. And uh, of course, this is not unique to bed or Brooklyn or New York or the United States. Um, you know, through international gatherings and net networks and whatnot, um, I've always been impressed by just how robust and active uh, Filipino civil society is. And even just in preparing for this event, taking a look online at the uh, the fora and the and the coalitions that have been built and the really creative, innovative, forward thinking, agile responses that Filipino civil society and coalitions have put together. I think that has been really inspiring for me. On the flip side, uh, I think what I'm seeing with my nights and weekends work is very different from what I'm seeing in my day job, my nine to five, or these days it feels like an eight to eight. And in my conversations with international agencies and multi-stakeholder fora and governments, I'm actually seeing quite a different response. Um, granted, it's patchwork, it's very different around the world, but. I live in the US right now. And I think the US is arguably uh, one of the worst responses in the world as um, in terms of responding to COVID. And we're seeing at the highest levels of government denial of the problems, blame of our citizens, corruption of stimulus funds, as well as in many other ways, and a real unwillingness to face the truth of what is happening. Obviously, it is an election year in the US, but we're seeing uh, gross incompetence and use of executive force to crack down on dissenters. And as we all know, this is not just in the US. And this really handicaps civil service, good people um, at all levels of government and their partners that want to do the right thing. But what happens then when the executive level of response is as such is what I've seen is people are exhausted. Internal politics have deepened and the fractures are becoming um, more and more fraught. Existing fragilities um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, broken systems, the, the sort of fractures 
have been highlighted and exacerbated. And I think that there's even an even greater mistrust now of outsiders and of what I call amateur change makers, community groups, civil society groups, and a real unwillingness to open up and collaborate. And this is a really big problem because mistrust goes both ways. When we mistrust our citizens and our civil society, it works as a self reinforcing loop. They then don't trust us either. And I think this is illustrated in multiple ways, um, and there's multiple reasons for this. Um, this is Jeremy Hyman's of purpose um, talking about the difference between old power values and new power values um, without getting into it because of time. I think a lot of government institutions and a lot of bureaucracies operate uh, with this more sort of top down uh, managerialism, um, sort of plan, 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 then execute way of doing things that is not really in tune anymore with how the world is evolving and how communities are self-organizing. And as an ethnographer, I have studied both development institutions, uh, bilateral agencies, multilateral agencies, governments. Um, I've done deep institutional ethnographies and just in my day-to-day -day work, I do community ethnography. And I've seen a real difference in the operational orientation that we are taking. Um, so institutions tend to do uh, tend to sort of assess and we have countless now working groups and task forces and commissions and then we plan 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 and then we do but the scale of the challenges that we face and how quickly they are evolving means that this approach isn't always working for us communities are doing throwing up a bunch of things seeing what works assessing and then planning to scale and evolve and invest in what works based on that um, we are asking different questions, you know, institutions are asking what is the right approach communities are asking what needs to be done right now. Um, and you can, I'm not going to go through this whole table, but I think there are fundamental differences in how these two operate, which doesn't mean one is better than the other. But I think it means that we need both and we need to understand how we work together differently and not just uh, mistrust from one another and close up. But I think just at a very individual level and a very, very personal level, um, I've been turning down a lot of government work um, and actually spending much more of my time just volunteering because I see that most of the change that is happening and that is responding to the urgent challenges that we face and the long term challenges is actually coming on the right hand side from the community driven change. And I don't think I'm the only one. Um, some of you may be familiar um, with uh, Ori Okolo. Uh, she's a Kenyan, um, sort of philanthropist, uh, activist, technologist. And in March, she posed a question around um, basically saying, what is a government? And she got some really fascinating responses on Twitter. Um, I think you can see this here. Uh, organized violence, crime, an archaic English noun that means harassment. A species of the leech variety, the strongest, most organized gang in a territory, a business, and do we even need one? And I think people all over are asking this very question. And I think for good reason. Um, it's not just in Kenya, it's not just in the US, um, though it does recall a famous quote from Ronald Reagan. The most terrifying words in the English language are, I am from the government and I am here to help. Now, obviously, I don't believe this, um, but at the same time, um, given Reagan's, I guess, legacy in the Philippines, and, you know, this might strike a chord with some of you all as well. And so I do wonder what can institutions learn from the community responses that we're seeing around the world? These are some of the lessons that I'm pulling out um, and happy to get into it in the discussion. But I think a bias towards action and I think really harnessing civil society in this amateur energy to respond and to reimagine our future is going to be essential. Because frankly, I think we there's a lot of talk about sort of new normals and building back better and whatnot. But I don't see a lot of difference in how we're actually going about these design conversations and these planning conversations. And I think people are really fed up and they're sick of talking about reform. Um, Angela Davis, a prominent um, civil rights activist in the US, has said the problem with reform 
is that reforms have often rendered the institution doing the reform itself more permanent. You know, we're, we, you know, I think folks are fed up with tinkering on the edges and with wanting to work with big institutions and then having the reforms be too incremental, too narrow, too marginal, too slow. And so, as other, you know, as Mr. Rumby um, and as you know, other speakers have, have talked about, I think we need to fundamentally reimagine what it is that we're doing and we need systems change. And systems change requires all of us because I think all of these actors that you see here, artists and activists and academia and civil society and companies and governments, we all play different roles, but the roles as commonly understood, you know, artists imagine, government sort of deliver, journalists monitor. They, these, these archetypal roles, I think, as we're seeing in an increasingly complex and fast moving world are simply too idealistic. They are too simplistic and they are actually even quite naive, I believe. And so I think to change systems, I think all of us, we need to change ourselves. It is not just enough for art artists whose job it is to re to help us reframe our world just to imagine and then to leave for the rest of us to do. They need to become advocates as well. Activists cannot just protest and um, and and uh, talk about what's wrong. They also need to help define paths towards what works. Um, researchers, you know, it's not enough just to assess and to analyze. We need to shape discourse and policy. And it's not just enough for governments to set policies and to deliver services. We also need to protect against uh, corrupting influences. Um, and I think right now, uh, you know, I think a lot of the media, uh, the business models for media are really um, set up to, uh, to sow divisiveness, to fuel fear and hate. And I think we need to counter that because uh, we need to, we need a, a robust public discourse and dialogue about what the future of our society should be and um, and media freedom and media protection and um, and and support for positive narratives and solutions journalism, whatever you want to call it, is going to be essential. But we talk about you know multi-stakeholder approaches. It's so hard. How do we overcome the mistrust, the fear, the shame that we don't know what it is that we're doing, the inertia of this is how we've always done it? Um, but I think that, you know, these are all, yes, these are all why we wouldn't. But I think to really build that better um, and to really reimagine governance, I think we have to. Because it is, you know, we all bring different superpowers. Uh, this last row here, I think our activists are contributing moral clarity and courage. I think academia is bringing the intellectual rigor. I think civil society can propel us towards action. I think companies have, you know, and, and the private sector bring, you know, incredible capabilities that the public sector doesn't have as evidenced by bed size drama, who by the way, was built by engineers and actors that public sector can't ever afford. Um, and so we need all of us because we all bring different superpowers and government alone is not going to be able to solve these problems that we're facing now. The problems are too great. Uh, the scale is too, um, too extreme and the problems are too embedded, the injustices too structural. And so I don't think this is utopian. Um, I think systems that sustain injustice were intentionally designed and futures that protect justice and equality can also be designed. And we see this in my home country of Taiwan. Um, I'm short on time, so I won't go through and I think sort of the Taiwan model has been well studied but I want to remind us too that I think the way Taiwan has developed this is not through, um, I think is really through this sort of last point here. It's a culture geared towards a whole society approach because it is essential. We did not have um, international agencies supporting us. We're not recognized by the World Health Organization. We have very few allies and partners around the world. And so we've had to rely on ourselves. We had to rely on our own expertise. And I think there's something really important in that. Um, in the self-deterministic approach that Taiwan took. And, um, and, and so I think my final point here is that a whole of society approach doesn't mean that we're all doing the same thing at the same time. I think we really need to think about how to structure and sequence these conversations to let artists and activists lead, to let researchers and civil society then determine how we set these paths and building on the creative work that they're already doing 
so that governments and companies um, and private sector then can help us figure out how we set policies and organize markets to realize uh, these more courageous futures. And I think we need to trust our people, trust the people, and they become trustworthy. Um, from Adrian Marie Brown, I think this is essential. And I think as we're seeing from around the world, it is essential um, to really bring in civil society and not let these past barriers and past fears, um, you know, uh, uh, make us fear collaboration. Um, and so with that, um, I believe, I believe that policy follows culture. And I think we are seeing massive cultural changes and policy needs to follow. Um, and so I think we can either sort of try and do that, uh, kicking and screaming, or I think we can embrace the rapid changes that are happening and think about how we uh, line up behind them and support them. Um, and so with that, um, thank you for having me and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Pastia. Um, I was very glad to hear you reveal that you're from Taiwan. We've actually done uh, a couple of activities or two or three with Taiwan already, and I think with any luck we'll do more. It's uh, standing out as a model, I think, for, for how to approach these problems. We recently had uh, Audrey Tang, your digital minister, in one of our activities. Fantastic uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. We'll, maybe we'll talk about that more during the uh, the Q and A. Thanks, Pantia. Our um, our uh, we have two panelists coming up, and before I introduce them. Could I, we already have two or three questions in the chat box. Could I ask everybody in the audience, if, they have, if you have a question, please type it in there. We're going to try to go through them more or less in that order. So try to get them in early. Um, thanks again to, to Jim and to Panthea for their, for their presentations. We have two panelists, uh, two uh, reactors coming up. The first one is Tess Garcia, Maria Teresa Magno Garcia. She's Director of uh, National Planning at the Department of Interior of um, of ICT rather, um, she has uh, she has spent most of her career in or all of her career in government and in in uh, in development. She started out in the office of the president and then moved to the presidential management staff before going on to the commission on ICT, a predecessor of the current department. She then spent several years at CEDA, the Canadian agency, and also in working on e-government before returning back to the Philippine government in 2014 to the ICT office, a later predecessor of the, of the department, and then finally uh, joining the department or being part of the department in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, Tess Garcia. Tess? Uh, can I be heard? Is my audio clear? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Coco. Thanks. Good morning, everyone, uh, especially fellow workers in government. So, magandang umaga po sa lahat. I think the challenge that we in government face right now is how do we bridge the new normal in how we govern using ICT. Now, I hope that in my succeeding slides, I am able to share how the, DC, the ICT is transitioning and supporting the use of ICT in governance in the new normal. Next slide, please. Now, technical advances have substantially changed the way humans produce, interact, and govern things. From the first industrial revolution way back in the 18th century that saw the impact of steam engines to productivity up to now, where we are faced with fast-paced application of ICTs not only in production but also in governance. By the speed these transformations are occurring, a fifth industrial revolution is already around the corner. Scholars forecast that the fifth industrial revolution will add personalization in technology or production, wherein businesses will move from for profit to, to benefit. Next slide, please. Now, this inevitable revolution places immense pressure on governments, especially the Philippine government, to keep up with the trends. Now, rapid adoption and application of artificial intelligence triggered by access to big data and better hardware processing capabilities are ushering a new phase in how governments respond to the clamor of its citizens for better and efficient services. Now, this scenario gives rise to smart governance. Now, the way we define smart governance is that it is about the use of technology and innovation 
for facilitating and supporting enhanced decision making and planning. Now, smart governance is about having a reliable, accurate, and up-to-date data. The data collected from different stakeholders can be used to get a better grasp on the country's needs and allows decision-making to become evidence-based, citizen-centric, and in impactful. Now, with smart governance, delivery of public services is more efficient. Information is transparent and accessible to the public. Communication and collaboration between the officials and the citizens is better and confidence and trust of people towards the government increases. Next slide, please. Now, the pandemic has transformed the landscape and created what we call a new normal environment. Now, working in the new normal environment may not be new for some companies, especially in the private sector, but maybe for some, especially for us in the public sector, this is actually a new experience for us. It may be very challenging, but there's no other way but to continue government operations. As we say, it's business as usual. Now, for the government, the pandemic has brought a paradigm shift in terms of its operations. Now, how are we going to move forward uh, given uh, the shift in paradigm? Now, I think the only way to go is towards digital transformation. Now, digital transformation is the goal of the Department of ICT, or Information and Communications Technology, from the from the very beginning, from the moment it was conceptualized, I think more than a decade ago, and institutionalized through the enactment of RA 10844 in 2016. Now, the DICT, where my department is, is set to lead digital transformation through what we call the Digital Philippines Vision. Now, the Digital Philippines Vision is DICT support to smart governance, where Technology and data are, are, are combined and used together to improve democratic processes and transform the ways that public services are delivered. Next slide, please. Now, realizing the importance of baseline ICT data for an informed decision making and planning, the DICT in 2019, uh, it was last year, we commissioned the conduct of what we call the National ICT Household Survey. Now, the survey is part of a long-term strategy to address the gaps in ICT statistics by gathering data from the households and individual respondents. Now, shown on the screen are notable results of the survey, uh, just a few. Uh, I think around 82% of households have television at home. However, you can see on the screen that only about 23 or 24% of the households have communal computers and only a few of them have their own internet access at home. Now, what does this mean? What these survey results mean? Now, what this means is that we need really to catch up to be in that situation that we're able to address the challenges of the fourth IR and we're ready for the fifth IR and even that of the challenges that we are facing right now in the new normal scenario. Now, the DICT shall continue to support uh, data-driven governance and we have lined up uh, various surveys. Now, this year, we will hold the Women in ICT Development Index and the IT BPM Baseline Survey. Now, the Women in ICT Development Index will collect data on women and girls and their access to ICT, while the IT BPM uh, Baseline Survey shall gather baseline data on the information technology and business process management sector. Now, this is to enable the government, uh, the Philippine government, especially the D Department of Information and Com Communications Technology, uh, to design responsive uh, government interventions for women and for the girls, and even to support the IT BPM sector. Now, also for, for the next two years, we have uh, lined up several uh, surveys. Now, for next year, uh, in, uh, in, in addressing the concerns regarding the new normal, uh, and then on the dirt of data, especially in the local government units, we're going to hold what we call the National Government Agency and the Local Government Unit uh, Survey uh, to gather ICT-related uh, administrative data in government agencies and to help determine LGU readiness for uh, digital LGUs under the new normal. So this is our, these are only the, a few of the data gathering activities that the ICT is currently doing and is going to plan to do in the next two years. Next slide, please. Now, the DICT has identified and are currently implementing various initiatives 
so that we can bounce back to recovery. I know for your appreciation, this slide is a representation of the select the ICT programs and projects that are seen to to be a catalyst towards our recovery. Now, in the interest of time, I, I think the presentation anyway is going to be shared to everyone. I will not go into the details of all of these programs. I will, however, in the succeeding slides, highlight programs I see as vital in attaining the strategic goals of having a better and secured connectivity, an improved government service, a strengthened human resource, and uh, having a greater public reach in the countryside. Next slide, please. Now, a safer, protected, and reliable connectivity is the key in ensuring efficient uh, work from home arrangement and zero contact delivery of frontline services, especially in the new normal. Now, this can be achieved through the DICT's National Broadband Program, the Free Wi Fi for All Program, and the Philippine National uh, PKR or the Public Key Infrastructure Project. Now, the NPP uh, National uh, Broadband Program aims to provide faster internet connections in government offices by end of 2021, wherein about 1,200 agencies is going to be connected. And uh, that would be uh, in national at, and even that of the local level. Now, on the other hand, we are targeting to provide uh, wireless internet access in public areas about 23,000 sites is targeted by the end of 2021. Now, to ensure a secured exchange of data uh, across government, the DICT is providing what we call the public key infrastructure as service. Now, this is very useful during this time where most government offices are working home are in work from home arrangements. Next slide, please. Now, to, to help the local government units bridge the new normal, the DICT initiated what we call the Digital Cities Program. Now, under the program, selected uh, select local government units uh, shall receive uh, tailored fit interventions to strengthen their capacity to effectively and efficiently utilize ICT, uh, and then also going to help them strengthen their local ICT councils. Uh, vital ICT infrastructures are going to be established, and individuals or uh, individuals within their area. Uh, we're going to capacitate them with their needed sk skills and knowledge. Now, I think it was last June, if I'm not mistaken, or July, that we have already announced the initial uh, 25 uh, digital cities and provinces that we are going to, to help in starting this year, 2021, up to, up to 2022. Now, uh, to complement this initiative, we have what we call the Digital Governance Award. Now, the Digital Governance Award is a joint project of the DICT with the DILG and that of the National ICT Confederation of the Philippines. This is an annual search for uh, best practices in local government units and how do they utilize ICT to effectively and efficiently deliver in public services. Next slide, please. Now, noting the changes brought by the pandemic and the new demands in, in terms of education, skills, and talents, we, we have what we call the Digital Education Program and the Digital Workforce uh, workforce Program. Uh, this is going to be implemented this year and to the next year. It's going to be building the capacity of uh, those who are employed, those who are out uh, underemployed, um, not employed right now, and even uh, women uh, out of school youth and those who would be needing capacity building, especially in the new normal. Next slide, please. Now, with the prolonged COVID-19 pandemic raging globally, everyone's evolving to embrace a new normal of live, learn, work, and play. You know, in the absence of a cure or a vaccine, now the pandemic is proving to be a test of long-term resilience, especially for the government and that of the people. Now, for us to thrive in the new normal, smart governance, which leverages technology and data, is one of the key. Now, to emphasize what James and uh, Pantea Ms. Lee mentioned a while ago, we have to design plans and programs now with the people. And in this way, the citizen will trust the government. I think that's the only way to go. Um, next slide, please. I think that's my, that is my last slide. Now, thank you everyone and keep safe. Now, we continue to hope that this pandemic will soon pass and we we recover uh, in the country. Now, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Tess. Um, our final speaker, our second uh, reactor and panelist, 
uh, literally needs no introduction, but because there's a slot to do so, I will introduce him anyway. It's Dr. Gerardo Sica. He's the first head of the National Economic and Development Authority when it was organized. And while there, he co-founded or founded the Philippine Institute for Development Studies uh, that we are now participating in. And the reason why uh, he needs no introduction is because he's been a career-long UP economics professor. He continues to teach now. Uh, I believe his, his current title is Professor Emeritus. And he's also the author of the textbook that I think most Filipinos have gone through when they passed through an economics course. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gerardo Sica. Dr. Sica? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Coco. I hope you can hear me. Good. You can hear you. Good. My, my task today is uh, really just to react to the presentations I heard. And I did not prepare anything uh, <clears throat> uh, very much, except that uh, the presentation I listened to very well, uh, the two of them. And of course, I was very interested in the third one, which is uh, really uh, a an effort to present what is in the horizon for the new Department of uh, the uh, uh, Department of uh, for Information Technology in, in our country. Mr. Bambri's uh, presentation is a very interesting, broad-ranging uh, assessment of the developments in uh, in the area of uh, responding to the crisis that uh, we, we now know to be COVID-19. But of course, many of the developments that he talks about are really related to trends and emerging uh, outcomes out of the uh, industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution that we know has been happening for some time now. Uh, these have been uh, uh, of great consequence to the manner in which uh, economies are adjusting to what's happening in the world. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, uh, in Mr. Bambri's presentation, I, I agree with a lot of what he says. Uh, they are uh, thought-provoking. They help in in uh, uh, creating what you might call a very widespread uh, uh, presentation of the landscape in which uh, uh, all the current uh, problems related to towards managing governance in the current uh, problems uh, are to be approached. Let me just simply uh, summarize uh, the main points that he said and i want to put them in my own words uh, the first is that uh, we look forward and not backward because uh, the past is not a good guide to the future the second item that he says is that uh, uh, governments have to be in control by coordinating parts of uh, by coordinating by strong coordination or else we might lose the uh, the total relevance to the situation. Uh, a third conclusion that he derives is that governments are challenged by uh, by uh, a, a, a weakening of uh, of uh, overall finances because uh, revenues are not rising as much as the increase in the. Uh, in, in the resources, I, I mean, in the demand for government spending and the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the pandemic has really enlarged the responsibilities of the government. Uh, this has a lot of implications on on the way uh, governments uh, perceive that, uh, I mean, uh, respond to the problems that we face. The requirements of socially distant uh, interactions uh, uh, 
uh, in, uh, in response to some of the problems related to COVID uh, has accelerated, uh, has uh, led to the acceleration, or further acceleration of, uh, of payment systems and governments are responding to this. Uh, the, the best governments will be able to adjust this much more and uh, uh, obviously those that fail to do it uh, will uh, will lag behind uh, a fourth item that he pushes hard on is that geopolitics can be a uh, game changer for most of us but uh, obviously uh, the world is not likely to uh, to be uh, simply standing aside, new leaders will be coming up to to, uh, to provide us with uh, with new uh, with, with new adjustments. As a result of this, uh, we can we can expect that countries will need to adjust to this. Otherwise, they might be left behind with the uh, with the adjustments that need to be made. Uh, the, uh, the digital revolution finally has reduced uh, in uh, in the context of the world in the context of uh, our problems the the great asymmetry in information between uh, between those in power and those who are governed this i think is a is a very important and powerful uh, uh, element in the in the way responses are to be judged in the context of uh, of uh, of uh, how govern uh, how how the governed react to the policies that are made by the various uh, uh, the various uh, actors in, in in government. I'd like to. To make uh, a, a few points that might be helpful here uh, in uh, relating the context of the Philippines to some of these problems, uh, it, uh, it is uh, uh, to some extent we uh, we have uh, we we have plans for a lot of. Uh, a lot of the adjustments to be made, but the uh, the uh, uh, but uh, there may be some uh, there may be some uh, elements of uh, of uh, developments which uh, could uh, actually. Uh, help us in uh, in uh, uh, let me see I, I'm sorry I'm, I'm a little uh, no Coco. Yes, uh, Dr. Speaker. I think, I'm, uh, I think I, uh, I'm not uh, likely to say anything. That's okay, uh, Dr. Speaker. At the moment. That's fine. Uh, we will we'll wrap up this section. We'll go to Q&A. I know there are questions for, uh, for yeah. all of you. And towards the end, actually, uh, if it's okay with you, uh, at the very end of the q and I, I think, I, I hope we inform you of this. I'll go back to you for a couple of minutes and sure, sure. should just give give a brief reflection there. Thanks very much. Okay, we have, um, I was about to start uh, counting how many questions we had. All I know is that we have a lot of questions. So I'll jump, in, I'll jump to them as quickly as I can and hopefully we'll get through most of them. Hold on a second. Just a second. I know the first question was from Action for Economic Reforms. I can't find it now. Hold on. 
There it is. Um, I'll be reading the questions in the interest of time. We 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 have I think about thirty minutes to do this. We should be ending by eleven thirty. So the first question is for Jim. Actually, it's from Jessica Reyes Cantos from the Action for Economic Reforms for the Philippines. Question for Jim for the Philippines, which is immensely challenged by connectivity and internet access. What would be an alternative approach to have rapid and reliable data? or targeted support and intervention for government and private sector programs. Towards the end of your presentation, Jim, you were talking about all these non-traditional information sources. I wonder if you could link that to, uh, to this lack of uh, internet connectivity in countries such as the Philippines. Jim? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I thought um, in, in part the... Um, presentation from Maria Teresa went to some of these issues uh, and what the Philippines is, what, what, what the actual plans are. I guess that, um, you know, part of the, part of the shift is to say the things we have invested in in the past uh, may not be as valuable as some things we can invest in now, uh, Coco, you and I had a conversation before the session started, for instance, about public transportation. And if, if people do actually start working more from home, if their cycles of commuting and work organisation change very dramatically, then the nature of investment in something like a public transportation system uh, changes. In, in this space, I think the opposite is occurring. So that the losses associated with not being as connected, with, with not having new forms of um, uh, technological communication and work uh, are, are increasing cost. So in a sense, the return is going up uh, quite dramatically. So uh, one of the things to question is, Yes, the starting position is exactly as outlined in the question. Uh, the issue is whether or not the circumstances have changed sufficiently to say um, the, the plans need to reorient uh, and double down very quickly. I gave the example of the bike lanes uh, in the Philippines. Um, similarly, that was a decision that was not foreseen, but was taken very quickly, I think, because of the stimulus uh, from COVID. So I, I would say that that's uh, without doing the real work, uh, which of course uh, colleagues in the Philippines would be very uh, well placed to do uh, on the starting position there and what uh, options there are. That, that is what I would say is that the returns now are much, much higher. So the opportunity foregone of not investing in these things very rapidly you know, is increasing. Not being an economist, I suspect the terms that uh, Jim um, uh, educated me about before the before the session are, are, are familiar to all of you. For me, it's a new a new phrase called positive returns from waiting, which uh, from which I gather a bit of. If we hadn't invested yet, we should stop uh, 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 blaming ourselves for it, but just get to the work now because at least now we can invest that properly. Um, could I turn to Tess? To, uh, to add something to that question. Yes, in terms of, and, and you did go into this quite a bit, but are there other approaches that you're considering that maybe you haven't uh, decided on yet that could speed up this uh, uh, getting getting connectivity to more of our citizens? Yes. Uh, I think primary right now in terms of what the ICT doing is for getting the broadband network in place. Uh, the broadband that would mean from Luzon, Vis, Visayas, and Mindanao, because that backbone uh, is very critical. Because without that backbone, it would be difficult for us to uh, provide the what we call the last mile connections. Uh, I, I cannot just, I just don't have the diagram to show you, but it's that we need to come up with that backbone. But, but the pri I think the primary consideration right now that the ICT is to uh, give priority in terms of the connection of the government, uh, because. Uh, we have to make sure that the online services of government would have to be there. Of course, 
we're going mm -hmm. to uh, we're going to help out also in terms of the connectivity with the with that of the public but i think priority right now especially for this year up to next year would be for the government uh, agency that's the reason why when i presented a while ago i only mentioned about the government agencies i, I did not mention about uh, regarding the uh, that of the public but what we're thinking is so that for the public um is we we can help the we can help the connectivity of the public through the local government units because the national broadband backbone would be made available to the local government units at some point in time. Uh, you can just imagine from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, you would have different what we call the access points. Now, these access points can be uh, accessed by uh, concerned local by um, I mean uh, interested interested local government units. And using the you know, the investment of the local government the units, they can they can actually have what we call the local broad, uh, broadband network. And from there, then the local government unit can can provide uh, the e connectivity with their citizenry. So that's that's for now. That's a strategy that we're thinking in terms of uh, the connectivity. I, I can only mention to you what we're doing currently in 2020 in a little bit of 2021 because the strategy uh, to some extent uh, changes. It's because you know in terms of technology, even because of the funding that we do have, uh, and we have we're having some difficulty also in uh, in the infrastructure. So I think, and we're also. Coming, we also have set up uh, policies already so that we have more um, cell towers uh, set in place. And together with the ILG, uh, it, I just cannot remember the number, but because of uh, with the help of the DILG and ARTA, local government units have already um, issued permits for uh, several thousands of cell towers, and that that's one. And we're also going to uh, help out in terms of uh, well on our own the the ICT we also have our own facilities that we are also improving right now so building the infrastructure uh, setting up the policy those would have to go hand in hand so that we are able to provide connectivity uh, well as soon as we can uh, the ICT is also would want to to have that connectivity in place already thanks very much Tess the next question is from Ross Klein in Playo. Um, of the University of the Philippines Institute for Small Scale Industries. I don't think this topic was uh, was taken up much by by any of the four speakers, but it is directed to all the four. I'll ask them if any of them has an answer to this. If not, then we may skip on to the next one. Um, the question is based on your analysis of the job market during COVID nineteen. What do you think are the kinds of jobs that be that would be more in demand in the post COVID world? What kinds of skills should workers strengthen now to make them more competitive or to make us more competitive as the pandemic recedes? Um, does, do any of the uh, speakers or panelists, reactors have a reaction to that? What kinds of jobs will be, will be increasing because of COVID-19? Well, I, I think, um... Uh, Coco, just to come in very briefly on that, I, I think the way the future of work is seen, it's being seen through the lens of two things. Uh, one is what is the nature of the relationship between the provider of labour and um, the nature of what is being done. So uh, I think that um, the manner in which uh, individuals are connected to the workplace is uh, changing to be much more agile. So, you know, concepts like lifelong employment, uh, even full in, even the nature of the employment contract itself uh, is changing quite uh, dramatically. And one of the reasons that's changing is that um, uh, the workers pro might provide their skills to more than one payer. So rather than having a relationship with one employer, as it were, have a relationship with more. And of course, some of these virtual network services uh, that have become very prevalent in many, many countries extraordinarily quickly are examples of that. The other thing is that, um, you know, numeracy, literacy, digital numeracy, literacy. So I think in a sense, you know, the demand for labor in traditional industrial production will continue to go down, demand for labour in uh, services, information, enrichment knowledge uh, goes up. So, I mean, I think that that's a continuation 
of a trend that has been in place uh, for some time. So I, I wish I could tell you where I where I where I heard the following, but we all we all listen to too many Zoom, too many webinars, so I don't know where I picked this up from. But what I did pick up was uh, it's, a, it's a question to answer your question. Don't we all think that you'll be there, there, there will be many more healthcare jobs uh, as uh, as we come out of this or as we progress through this? Won't there be more logistics and delivery jobs as well, both uh, both uh, in, in in an office wherever that office is, and also the actual delivery? Um, there are also people who are talking about when you have that kind of delivery situation. That means more. Uh, call centers and BPOs to a certain effect around the world, and hopefully they they uh, they locate some of that here. So those are the kinds of jobs I think some of the kinds of jobs that might uh, might pick up in uh, in a post COVID world. Let me jump to the next question. I, I apologize because the um, the chat box jumps uh, whenever somebody adds a question, so I get a bit lost here. Give me a second to find where we are. The next question is uh, from Mario Aguha, and again, it's, it's directed to, to everyone. Um, is the Philippines in the third or fourth industrial revolution? Actually, he says technolo technological revolution. I think we need to clarify where we are exactly. Our problem in the education sector uh, under COVID only highlights the dismal state of our digital environment, digital divide, is affecting education today under the new normal. Um, Jim, to your point about how how uh, the the ability of people to, to to log on to this digital world comes up here. Could I ask uh, the other speakers uh, if they could answer this, or maybe doc, Dr. Reyes could answer? Are we in the third or fourth uh, industrial revolution? And uh, given that answer, um, how how would that um, relate to the problems that the education sector is having right now? Um, yes, I think um, the state varies across sectors. So for some sectors are more advanced than the others. And so that poses challenges in terms of how we deliver our um, services. So in the case, a particular case cited here, education, I think, um, we're still quite far in terms of being able to apply or make use of all the technologies out there. Um, but the pandemic is actually um, pushing us to take advantage of this opportunity to accelerate the pace of adoption um, in the case of the education sector and I suppose for the other sectors as, as well. I, I think what is good is that now it forces us to look around and see okay, what are the best practices out there and can we immediately implement some of this. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Rice. The reason I ask you that is because I think in one of the recent APPCs, the title was already fourth industrial revolution. So um, I just needed to clarify whether we were actually in there, but your point, I guess, is well taken that it, it varies across sectors. Do any of the other speakers have something to add to that or otherwise I'll go on to the next question. Okay, the next question um, comes from Jed Rabena, and uh, Jed is, uh, is saying and asking, NED has announced that it's high time for the Philippines to put greater priority on digital economy and connectivity. How can foreign investors help in this regard? I'm going to, uh, to throw this to Tess, and then maybe any of the others if they have a comment on this. Um, foreign investors in the ICT, in the digital economy connectivity space, Tess? Sorry, Coco, I wasn't able to Sorry. Uh, get the, the question. The question is, um, how can foreign investors help with digital economy slash connectivity? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, currently, we are encouraging uh, the investors, uh, foreign investors, uh, to partner with local telcos in building the self hours. I think there were several already uh, foreign investors that have uh, signified interest with uh, with that of Globe and Smart uh, to to come up with the to to establish the the cell towers. Now, you know that there's a limit in terms of the foreign ownership when it comes to telcos. 
So it's that. So we still have that uh, until the law is going to be uh, changed. So we have uh, in terms of the ownership, foreign ownership for, for telcos, but bringing in uh, foreign investment uh, regarding um, erecting the, the cell towers, that one we are we're, we're encouraging uh, foreign investors. And to of course they have to they have to partner with local companies uh, so that they can be able to to um, establish the cell towers. Thanks. I, I'm not so sorry uh, to answer the question. Yep. Thank Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, the next question is actually more a comment, and it's a comment for uh, for for Panthea Lee. Um, uh, Thelma Manuel says. Uh, to to Miss Lee, I like your presentation. It gives a gives a new perspective to a whole of society approach to governance. Uh, Pante, I think uh, we have all heard that term before, whole of society approach. Uh, whenever we talk about development issues, could you could you elaborate a bit on how this can be more real, especially in the time that, in the kinds of times we are in now, this whole of society approach. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the comment. Um... I think we often talk about whole society approaches because I think we recognize that the uh, social fabric is shifting. I think citizens are rightly having uh, more and more urgent and loud demands. And I think there's a recognition that we need to, um, to engage all sort of different actors in society, not just citizens, but I think that's really what's sort of pushing us to do this. Um, we don't have the capacity, the resources, the sort of, you know, know how to, 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 to do all of this. And yet, at the same time, um, I find as at least um, in the sort of context that I work in, um, whether you call it whole of society, whether, whether you call it co-creation, co co I think there's a real desire to do this. But I, I think right now it is still largely in the lip service stage. And I don't think that is intentional. I don't think people are intending to bring lots of different actors. They don't do it. But I think it requires um, recognizing that all the different actors that you are trying to bring in from different um, aspects, you know, different parts of society um, come from very different backgrounds and expertise and, you know, and also there's just very different power dynamics. So when you are trying to bring in, uh, uh, you know, actors from more marginalized society, from more marginalized sort of parts of society, and expect them to be able to participate in dialogue in the same way that, you know, folks from, say, academia, or that have long worked in government, um, you know, that they are able to do so, it's just simply not real. And so we sort of take input, we take input, but then because it's not easy for us to use, I think we often then don't know what to do with it. And so we end up just relying on one another that, you know, I think workshop participation nowadays is a professional skill. How do you speak in sound bites? How do you use the terminology that everyone else understands? Um, how do you, you know, and I think that um, I think that's really sort of misguided, and I think we end up missing out on a lot. Um, and I think we also don't invest necessarily the resources into standing up ideas that are coming from folks that are outside the uh, very sort of narrow um, and powerful elite. Um, I don't think again this is intentional, but because like, we don't invest the time to understanding sort of what that looks like. So I think there's a lot of sort of work to be. Thanks very much. I've skipped over a couple of the digital questions because there's a there's a there's a slew of them, but I'll go back to them after we tackle some other topics. The next question actually is for Panthea and Jim again. For Panthea again and for Jim. And it's for from uh, Dr. Vic Pakeo. Good morning, Dr. Pakeo. Um, the question is, it's been said that systemic changes require change in all of us. Actually, uh, Panthea, you mentioned this. Uh, you have systems change, but that requires change in all changing ourselves. What gives you hope? That these changes will occur in the face of deep divisions among our country's citizens in regard to attitudes, core values, and views and facts and truth. Um, I'm not sure if he's talking about this particular country or 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 uh, or several countries around the world, and the rise of obscurantism and the undermining of science and evidence-based policy. Witness what's happening in the U.S. He's talking about the U.S. Apparently, what gives you hope despite all of this? what gives me hope right now man it's a good question um i i spent a lot of time thinking and reading and talking to people about this very question um so i appreciate it i don't know i have a good answer um i think just as i've been processing all of this um whether it's in the us or other countries that i'm working in um kind of part of the answer that i've gotten to is that um i think there's a lot of um 
I think there's a lot of trauma that we haven't, you know, talked about and healed from. Um, you know, in the US, obviously, there is a conversation happening right now around systemic oppression, around structural racism, around white supremacy, and around what that means. Um, I think, you know, globally, um, a lot of countries I work in haven't had conversations around the impacts of colonization um, and what that have done to us as a people. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, what our relationship with international institutions and are, um, and with other sort of partners are. And I think we adopt a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of technical language and technocratic ways that we want to change things. But, you know, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm in those conversations. I'm usually surrounded by uh, economists and lawyers at the, as the sort of anthropologist and journalist that is, you know, perhaps uh, just trying to keep up. But I also think that there's a lot of work um, and I'm, I'm really fascinated by uh, practitioners now working in the areas of um, somatic practice and around embodied justice and around um, understanding just trauma. Because I think that you know, humans resort to narratives um, that, are, that we might deem conspiracy theories. And so much what we talk about, you know, the American dream, you can be anything that you want to be, it's not true. You know, um, social mo 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 mobility in the U.S. is just not a reality anymore. And you have big media in bed with big corporate and bed with big governments um, telling people that policymaking is something you can possibly understand. Governance is too complicated for you to understand. Do you pay attention to Brad and Angelina and the Kardashians and whatnot? And don't worry your pretty little head about it, but you live in a democracy, you know, and this is going to work for you. And I think that's why people result to sort of, you know, disinformation, disinformation. I think, yes, yeah, so you need, you know, I'm working with private sector companies around sort of misinformation campaigns. Um, but I think there's a lot of sort of, I think someone else in comments termed the sort of softer side of things. And I, I, I don't think we give enough attention to the soft side. And I think there's a lot of trauma that we just need to heal from and talk about. Um, so there's some work I'm doing around truth and reconciliation commissions, but there's a lot of problems with the transitional justice space as well. So. I'll stop there. But Thanks very much. Thanks, sir. Um, coming very briefly on that one. Yes, please go ahead. Um, I mean, uh, after you speak, uh, after you speak, Jim, I hope it's okay, Dr. Seacat, if I if I turn to you on this question. Go ahead, Jim. That's good. Dr. Seacat might like to come in on the earlier labor force question as well, which I'm sure he would have uh, views on. It would be good to hear them, if possible. Go ahead, Jim. Um, um, you know, I don't know if I'm. 100% optimistic. I've got to say, uh, a, a lot of things that have happened in in the world in some places, uh, which I won't mention by name because I don't think I meant to, uh, have sort of shaken some of my views about institutions to the core. Karl Popper, um, the British philosopher, defined democracy. He said, you know, there's all this question about how do you define a democracy? What is it? The characteristic that matters is the peaceful transition of power when you have a poor leader, right? And to me, that really resonates uh, in, in its simplicity uh, and its, uh, its profoundness, actually. Uh, so some countries are perhaps testing that in ways that we hadn't seen before. So even though they look like a bu bureaucracy, talk like a, bu uh, sorry, democracy, in many ways, they're not exhibiting uh, those features. Uh, I think that, um, what I was trying to get in the, in the second to last slide of my presentation was that this changing of authority or power, or the changing of power with information, the realignment, the breakdown of the traditional asymmetry of information between government and people and within government does give rise to the idea that communities and individuals can have much more leverage uh, than they did before. Now, the missing link there is that a lot of those platforms still rely on very narrow interests. So the big issue, I think, to government is to work out the regulatory regime that relates uh, to those narrow interests to serve the broader interests. Now, I don't necessarily think that that will happen in one step or two steps. That might take more. Uh, in the meantime, I think um, the way information is going, communities uh, and smaller groupings of people, not just because of uh, transportation reasons, but many other reasons, uh, will uh, contribute to a more communitarian orientation, which is uh, very similar to, to what we just heard from Tampere as well. Thank, th thanks, Jim. Um, Dr. Seagat, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, repeat the question and also try to bring us back to our theme, which is uh, innovation and governance. 
I guess so if, if, if I was to paraphrase what Dr. Pakeo is saying, we have a huge new kind of problem now. Uh, and it's happening at a time where it's possibly contributing to the kinds of divisions that we have, um, not just in this country, but in other countries as well. Um, as an economist and as a former economic manager, how does I'm, I'm going to I'm going to remove the, the the question about hope because that doesn't sound like an economic question. How does um, how should economic managers and the private sector try to attack these problems, given the fact that the problems are very new and very big, and also we have these divisions that are that are dividing us. You know, some of the problems that we have uh, tend to focus on on uh, the uh, outcomes that are I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm disoriented. I'm sorry. Um, I, I should be talking. <laughs> um, why don't I go back? Because I think that's actually a good question to end our conversation with. So when we end uh, the Q&A, I would ask you, Dr. Sika, um, how you think we should be approaching these problems, given that the problems are very new and very big, and we have all these divisions uh, uh, in our country and, and, and around the world, which makes it more difficult to attack any problem at all. So maybe if it's okay, I'll ask that at the very end of the of the Q and A, Dr. Sika. I'll okay. go to the thanks very much. I'll go to the next uh, the next question again. It's jumping around here. Um, let me go to. This question again for everybody is the new normal here to stay um and i think in 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 uh in in jim's presentation he had he had actually had, uh, another term for for new normal which i found which i found interesting uh a lot of innovations have been introduced in government processes you know, including with the help of ict but all of these are introduced only in interim nature are we expected to revert to the usual processes including physical processes once the vaccine arrives. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll end the question there. Is the new normal here to say, is there any way of saying which parts um, are going back to the old normal and which parts do you think are forever changed? And I'll start with Jim. Sorry. Um, yeah, this is uh, the question I tried to address really, which is, uh, where do we revert to the mean is to use a sort of economist type expression, I guess, and, and where do we go on a different path? And some of those examples that I use uh, um, on occasion when the world is beset by a shock or response to a shock, it takes it on a different path than it had previously. So one of the examples was um, uh, the attitudes uh, and welcoming to women in the workforce in a lot of countries that sent males off to, to war in World War II, that was not a conscious policy, but what happened was adaptation to the requirements for one part led to another part. So, I mean, it's a very good question and quite frankly, we don't know the answer to the question. Uh, one, one way of thinking about it is you take a step back and you say, you know, we do treat this as a, as a, you know, once in a lifetime event. We don't know that it's a once in a lifetime event. We don't know that it's not now an event that will occur every 18 months. We certainly hope that that's not the case, uh, uh, but we don't know that that's not the case. Uh, if we think that um, with slight variations in biological makeup, um, the responses to the other viruses in the last 20 years, such as SARS and um, uh, the Middle East one, uh, if that had been different, uh, the outcome could have also been uh, quite quite different. So we just don't we just don't know that. But certainly, there are those that will argue that this is just an aberration. Um, the aberration will be solved when there is a vaccine, and then we'll all get back to normal and. Uh, instead of talking to you like this, I'll be on the plane across to Manila and then back to Washington, et cetera, et cetera. 
I'm not so sure that 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 is going to happen. I think the cost benefit of many, many different things uh, that we've done in the past will be challenged uh, going in the future. We have, of course, the world's not uh, stationary. We have at the same time more information coming to hand about climate, more knowledge uh, about actually the effects we can have on climate by adjusting our behaviours. I mean, that's one of the definite unintended consequences of, of the lockdown, the amount of information that's provided about uh, our relationships with the climate and how to affect it very quickly. Uh, so different organisations of work also back into that. So you have a whole lot of things, I think, that are pushing in a direction that says for sure that the new normal will not be like a rephased uh, old normal, right? The question is on how many of these um, platforms uh, will, will it be? Will it be different? Um, time, you know, time will tell. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I think we have time for one last question, and I'm going to take it from from our viewers on Facebook. The question is uh, from Ramir Balkin, and uh, let's see who who it goes to. What does it take? for new changes in public sector governance to become co-equal contributors to doing improved public service when some public institution, institutions are hardwired hardwired to business as usual thinking. I'm going to go first to Panthea and then I'll ask the others if they have a response to that question. So I think you were talking about this, Panthea. Uh, uh, private sector wants to help, the civil society wants to help, but they're not used to and or the government is not used to that kind of, of uh, collaboration. Uh, what would it take um, to change that? Oh my gosh, um, it's a really good question, co-equal contributor. Um, I think we need to raise the stakes. I think we need to, um, I, I don't know, the, it's tough, right? I think both the, the carrot approach to asking nicely uh, doesn't necessarily work. And I think that um, just, you know, even just going to the new normal, I'm, I'm actually currently in a, in a Denmark where a lot of folks are just, uh, it, it seems to be sort of shockingly normal. And I was like, oh, I'm so glad I'm back to normal. I'm so glad I'm like, no, I, like, I don't want it to go back to normal. Normal sucked. Normal was terrible. Uh, normal meant tons of people who were oppressed and tons, you know, there's huge in, in, in inequities that um, that the pan pandemic has exposed, and so I don't want it to go back to normal. And I think a lot of the community groups and advocacy groups I'm working with are thinking the same. Um, at the same time, you know, I think the the way that we're doing advocacy is also not particularly effective. We are yelling at government and we are yelling at um, uh, companies in the media, and then telling them, you know, we need big structural change, we need all these things, but we are not um, either monitoring the implementation. We're not defining the mechanisms that we want to see. And I, I think a lot of civil servants are rightly exhausted. They're good people that are trying to do the right things with too few resources, overworked and underpaid. And, you know, and so how do we actually um, think about how to create spaces to have these conversations where people can bring um, the, the sort of their, I call them superpowers, um, sort of radical imagination, moral courage, and then technical expertise on legislative operational, um, you know, the pr procurement regulations, sort of operational details. Um, and I think we need new spaces that are not just defined by institutions of, of power, because like it or not, power likes to hold on to power. And I don't think there's going to be the incentives to change there, but I think we need to raise the stakes on what happens if we don't. Um, and I think that is then, you know, sort of, how do we have public discourse? How do we shape civic imagination? Um, Jeff Mulgan has a great paper right now um, around with Nesta, uh, not Nesta, with Demos Helsinki, that we just have a real lack of civic and public imagination right now. We can't imagine positive alternatives. And so we're just trying to tweak incremental, incrementally. And I really hope that um, we can seize the momentum from this moment to make the big changes. Um, but I think we need to raise the stakes and create new fora for this to happen. Thanks very much, Montea. Um, we've actually run out of time, but I'll ask uh, Dr. Sika. Dr. Sika, do you have a reflection before we close? Well, uh, I'd like to point out uh, one important uh, experience that we've had in the past, and I think uh, we can. We uh, I can start from that. 
you know, what worked uh, in the past may not work in the future. For instance, uh, in the past, uh, we used, we, we developed a method of uh, trying to get laborers uh, go abroad as a temporary measure because we, we were unable to get the policies completely right for the domestic level with a high rate of protection being uh, a major component of policies that are related to foreign investments. And you know the story of this, it, it relates to past mistakes or past uh, devotion to particular models of protection concerning concerning the coming of uh, the attraction of foreign capital to help develop our country. What we missed in that framework was uh, a very big, uh, I would say a very big mistake in, in, in our development uh, history, partly because we were emphasizing the needs of sectors and, and and stakeholders in the domestic economy, which were basically in control of many of the levers of power that uh, provided support for what they wanted to develop for the country. Uh, with that in mind, what happened was that the country uh, developed a model by which we, we just uh, tried to support a growth of, uh, of uh, a strong export sector, which was designed mainly to, to, to export to foreign countries, but they were not integrated locally to the, to the domestic economy. As a result, what we had was a situation in which the domestic economy became relatively uh, isolated from the more efficient export-oriented economy of the world. Now, this thing still is a problem in the way our incentives framework in the Philippines are, arrayed, uh, are made. And uh, it's very hard even for the current setup for, for leaders to understand that we have to, we have to make the opportunities for foreign capital to compete locally as well as uh, and and to help unite unite the sector in the in the local industry with with a wider export sector that we could develop uh, unfortunately the the isolation of this has made us into a uh, into an economy that is feeding a small sector for the export market but not developing a very large internal domestic sector that fed into the supply chain of our domestic of our exporting industries uh, when we look at when we when we sent foreign when we sent labor to to other countries it was because capital was very uh, uh, capital is abundant in foreign countries but we have not increase the capital coming into the country. Uh, I think this is still a, uh, a major failing or a major issue for domestic, for leaders to understand. The leaders of our country must be able to, to uh, stimulate the incentives so that we can bring in more foreign capital. But uh, look at the way uh, the priorities of, uh, of the uh, of the moment are being made we are more concerned with with creating the the uh, uh, um, um, any projects that would supply subsidies to existing uh, to people who are who are affected by by the problems of pandemic and the unemployment that has resulted from it but we can generate. We, we we can still work towards creating a a, a much more dynamic uh, uh, economy through the uh, through uh, the uh, stimulation of the foreign investment sector. We're not in the. We're not yet in the conversation for attracting transfers of uh, companies 
from China going to going to the Philippines, but they're going to other countries. They're going to India. They're going to Indonesia. They're going to other uh, places. So, in effect, I think we have to work hard in creating that setup. But uh, part of the issues are really tied up with uh, what we call uh, understanding the uh, the main problems for uh, for uh, introducing the expansion of uh, attractions or stimulate uh, st stimulus towards uh, towards the uh, coming in of uh, some useful and more important foreign direct investments. What what would come out of this? Uh, in countries where where the where the forward motion of the domestic economy and the export economy was very high, uh, the level of employment has risen, and the level of employment of of people uh, who are workers in the economy has led to, towards the fulfillment of uh, of you might say the satisfaction of the immediate needs of workers. They don't have to. They don't have to go abroad to feed their families at home, because if they are here, they would be able to really, uh, really contribute towards the uh, the the stabilization of a productive home base, which supports not only domestic needs but also the needs of the world, as we are able to raise our capacity towards that. So, Doctor Seekers. Dr. Siga, thank you very much for that perspective. Um, and I'd like to thank all the all the other speakers as well today. Jim Bromby from World Bank, Panthea Lee from Reboot, Tess Garcia from DACT, and thanks uh, from me to uh, to PADS for asking me to, to participate again today. I'm going to hand you over now to back to Sheila. Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Coco for that excellent uh, moderation of uh, our uh, first uh, webinar for the um, annual public policy webinar series. Uh, I'm having a problem enabling my video. Okay, but uh, just a few reminders before we finally say goodbye. So uh, we can access uh, all the presentations from the PIDS uh, website. And um, okay, so also a gentle reminder to please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar, and we will also email you the link after the event. Um, please do let us know how we can improve our um, webinars, and uh, also please regularly visit our website in our social media pages. And for more information about uh, the Development Policy Research Month and our activities for the entire month of uh, September, please visit dprm.pids.gov.ph and our Facebook page. We still have one more, uh, we still have three more webinars left for this uh, month. So flash on your screen are the, um, are the dates. So on, on September 17, we'll, hear more about institutional innovations and reforms under the new normal and then september 22 um strengthening the civil service under the new normal and september 24 uh we'll talk about smart systems for agile governance okay and then uh finally we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government academic civil society business and international development community who join us today and you can see the names of this office is on the screen. Again, uh, thank you very much um, to all of you, to our moderator, to all our speakers and panelists, and to all our participants for being part of webinar one of this year's annual public policy conference. See you all on Thursday for the second part of our webinar series. Enjoy the rest of your day and always stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Sorry. Thank you, everybody. Bye.